week. And so uh, trying to get these guys tonight after the first Friday night after our Bible study to vote on whether or not as a church we want to confirm that these two guys are called to serve in our church. So I thought it would be good for Colin to have his chance uh, and for you guys to get to know him a little bit. So Colin's going to give his testimony right now. Absolutely. Hey, for you, those of you who don't know me, um, I get really, really nervous when I'm in front of crowds. And uh, it took me a really long time to even get up here on stage uh, to play and sing and do those kinds of things. Um, and to do this kind of thing that I'm, what I'm, that what I'm doing right now absolutely petrifies me. Girls are smiling at me because they know exactly where I'm coming from. When I first started up on stage, they had to constantly tell Samantha, like, we will put your mic right up here so they can hear you talk. But I still have a tendency to hold it way down here. But um, just to give you guys a little bit of background on, on me, I was saved when I was 13 years old in a church in Sand Springs that I grew up in. I was baptized shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, basically, it's where we grew up in Sand Springs. Um, and I was blessed to have two godly parents um, that raised me and my sister uh, in church. Um, and I know a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to have that, but it's something that is in my life that I'm truly grateful for. But as I grew older and typical teen angst came up, um, couldn't wait to get out of Sand Springs. I couldn't wait to get on with my life, to get on to college, to get out of Sand Springs because I absolutely hated it or thought I hated it at the time. And um, pretty soon I graduated high school and I uh, went to Tulsa Junior College uh, before I became Tulsa Community College. And uh, the problem was is that so was the rest of my senior class. Um, and so it was kind of just like high school. Um, and so while we were up there at TCC, we constantly didn't go to class. We constantly sat around and goofed off. Um, and that led to the beginning of me kind of starting to steer away from all of my upbringing that, you know, my parents had tried so hard to, um, you know, discipline me and, and steer me in the right direction. And so it wasn't long before uh, uh, this, this Christian kid that, you know, grew up in church, uh, knew it was wrong to drink, knew it was wrong to smoke, knew it was wrong to do all these things. Instead of just hanging out playing ping pong, we started talking about, well, we're going to go get drunk that night. And having them going off and, and having these parties and things like that. And so needless to say, I quit concentrating on school um, and really just more or less concentrated on all the wrong things, which I thought at the time were friends, you know, popularity, having fun, all that kind of stuff. Um, and as you guys know, that has absolutely nothing to do with what a successful person is. Um, so as I went through that, um, I ended up flunking out of TCC. This put me on academic probation, and uh, I decided to try to get my life right, so then I went um, and enrolled in Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, thinking a change of scenery, change of pace uh, would really help. And uh, my first semester there, I was accepted on a uh, basis that I was on academic suspension, and that if I was able to raise my grades up, that I would be able to uh, continue to go to school there, and they would give me all the help that I, that I could. And um, it was just one of those deals that the first semester did really good. Um, and then all my friends in the dorms decided, hey, we're going to move out and get an apartment. And um, a bunch of college-age kids, that's usually no good. Um, and so that eventually led to um, me joining a fraternity. And before all that, uh, the guy that led me to the fraternity was actually a guy that was in one of our Bible studies that we tried to um, stay active in and uh, and and try to participate in on a weekly basis and this kid was a Christian kid and and uh, he said he really liked the fraternity um, but at the time I thought that was an absolutely excellent decision and for a long time I thought that was the best decision I'd ever made in my life um, but as you guys probably know where this is going it was absolutely not the best decision um, I go into the fraternity and uh, the drinking only got worse the partying only got worse and I was initiated into my fraternity that pledge semester. I pulled a .3 GPA. Um, I basically flunked every class except for one and had a D in that class because um, we were just literally just living it up, you know, partying all the time. And, uh, of course, that led into drugs. So God started smoking pot back then and those kinds of things. And um, it just really kept steering me down this really, really horrible lifestyle uh, that was not a good place to be. Um, and so, obviously, the, the fraternity 
life that doesn't really help you. It's not conducive to studying. It's not conducive to getting close to God. It's not conducive really to anything except the steps toward a mature saint. It's just not what we're here for. Um, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes at the time, uh, during the day, ripping at the same time. I mean, I can't tell you all the stuff that, that went on, but it was just I was not in a good place, away from my family, away from all Christian influences. Um, but it was also at that same time that, uh, for whatever reason, I thought it would be a good idea to start writing hot checks. And I got on this hot check writing streak and uh, ended up having to go to the uh, attorney general's office, or not attorney general, attorney general's office, but county prosecutor, and uh, sign in a bunch of papers. I had to write my signature over and over and over again, so I couldn't come back later and say I didn't like this check. Um, and I actually had one that was on the verge of becoming a felony uh, that was um, in initially dismissed because the company decided to leave out. Um, I ended up charging one of my dad's gas cards. I had a $3,000 limit up, maxed it out. He called me one day at the university and said, I can't get gas. He said, uh, you, my card's maxed out. He said, you know what happened? And I said, yeah, I was spent on beer and cigarettes and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And, and that's a lot of money to just blow and waste with my parents. Um, so my dad started receiving these calls from these attorneys and these businesses of, of where I was writing these hot checks from. And I got a call one day, and he said, you're coming home. He said, I've had enough. Um, and so I came home, um, obviously very stubborn, very um, – you know, regretfully, uh, regretful, I guess, of the things that I had done, of the disappointment that I had caused my family. And uh, I was greeted at the front door um, when I pulled into the house by my parents. And uh, they said, you got three options. Um, they said, your first option is to join the military, um, move out of the house and get your life straightened up with them. And the second choice was, is we're going to completely cut you off. Uh, we're not going to give you any support. And you go back out into the world and you try to live on your own. And the third option was you stay here, you get a job, we'll help you try to get your life in order, and we'll get all these bills and all these debts paid. Um, so obviously I chose uh, option three um, and, and ended up trying to pay all these debts off. Um, and that was the beginnings of my whole departure interstate um, and being in that. And I started working at Binding Stevens in 1998. And I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Finding Stevens, but it was a big garden center in Tulsa that's no longer in business. And uh, it's where I met Vanessa. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. I actually met Vanessa because I was asking one of her friends out and uh, was trying to ask her her phone number. And you know, that you see where that led to. So um, it's a good thing. I'm truly blessed. But uh, the day that I asked her out, I knew that she doesn't want to be a woman with me that's going to have to suffer from the influences, that's going to have to suffer from, uh, you know, a stinky house and, and clothes, and, and, and I'm not making judgments on anybody that does this, but I decided that it was up to me to quit smoking, and I quit smoking cold turkey the day that Vanessa and I started dating. Um, and so uh, we decided that after a period of three years, we were going to get married, um, and we got married, and thinking that we were just madly, truly in love. And as you guys know, nobody's in love with each other when they're first get married. It's just absolutely impossible, I believe, until you've been married for 10 years because you just have no idea the ups and downs and the swings and all that stuff. So after we get married, there's things that we had done, and I'm still this immature kid that is still wanting to run off and play video games and play on the computer and not take care of my responsibilities. I had a job. Um, and I would go to it, but I really did nothing else at that point to really be a good husband of what uh, God had called me to do. Um, and I just completely, like I said, ran this whole time. And uh, even when we went to church, uh, my best friend's dad was the pastor of the church that we'd gone to. And uh, I really went to church more to just hang out with my best friend instead of really going to church for the right reasons. Because all afternoon we got to go ride four-wheelers and we got to go fish and we got to do all these kinds of things. And so I didn't even look forward to going to church. I just wanted to go play afterwards. Um, make a long story short, we ended up having Mom. Uh, she was born two months premature, and that was kind of the beginning of me growing up. Um, because when you have a child in the hospital for 30 days, it's just really, really tough. And, you know, Vanessa and I had to really grow up a lot during that time. 
hand down. During that time as well, Viney Stevens was getting really, really worldly, and, and it was this awful environment to work in. And Vanessa and I started praying for God to open up a door. And, I mean, I kid you not, like six months later, Viney Stevens closed. I mean, it was this, and if that's not of God, I have no idea what is, what you can call that. But uh, I think that was God completely shutting the door and opening up the opportunity. That allowed us to move here, um, and that's where I started working for Greenleaf. Um, Jay Baker helped me get on over there at Greenleaf, and ultimately I have to give God the credit because he opened up a door for somebody that had already taken our job. And Greenleaf offered it to me afterwards, um, even though they had already offered the protection in another job. So I gave nine years of service to Greenleaf, um, and then it got to be to the point that life was so stressful. Um, they're working 70, 80 hours a week, five to six months out of the year, um, that I was putting Greenleaf ahead of my entire family. And so once again, we prayed. God opened up a door, and that's why I'm a senior plant partner. Um, God blessed me with the same pay. Um, I did lose a couple of benefits, but I don't have to work near the amount of hours that I did at Greenleaf. Brian Chonak of the owners of Christian Owners, um, and so it's a Christian environment to work in where we can pray at work, we can do all sorts of stuff, and that's just God as he's kind of blessed us. And, you know, like I said, that's just the top of my story. Um, you know, it's easy to look back and say that Vanessa helped me to quit smoking um, or to say that Binding Simply or Binding Stevens was simply just going to go out of business. It's easy to say that I just gained all of my horticultural experience without going to college because I did. Um, it's easy to say that love is what kept Vanessa and I together for all of those years. And the fact is <coughs> that God has worked through my life, even when I ran continuously from him, and my talents, my spirit, and my path. He has stayed beside me this whole journey. He has made me successful. He has blessed me with my wife and my children, and he has blessed me with a church body that we wholeheartedly love to serve and be a part of. God has been the glue that has kept us together even though I absolutely do not deserve it. You see, we're not owed anything, not even our next breath. And, um, you know, he's gifted each of us with unique talents and abilities, um, and I believe that those change from time to time when God calls us to go off and do different things. Um, and it says in the Bible that Jesus said that um, the branches cannot live separate from the vine. I'm going back to a horticultural reference here. And as you guys know, a plant grows up from the bottom and it has a trunk and then limbs start to branch off. And as those limbs branch off, in order to make a tree or a plant to grow better, you have to chew it, you have to prune it, you have to maintain it. Because if you just constantly let it go, it gets all wild, it gets ugly, it, it gets just nasty. And so I'm thankful that when God disciplines us, he comes in and he prunes us, not so he's cutting off my arm, but so that we can grow again and we can reach out and develop new branches, new talents, new flowers, and new fruits. Um, you know, a plant produces energy by the sun. You guys probably know photosynthesis, but we get our energy from the sun. And uh, if it wasn't for him, life would be uh, be in a really bad place. But I love you guys, um, I thank you for supporting me and my family, for loving us, and I look forward to serving you guys in the future. Thanks, Colin. Let's uh, have a word of prayer over uh, Colin and his family and our church again, as we have this decision to make. Um, God's already made the decision, but it's our job as a church whether or not we affirm it and whether or not we truly obey uh, is God, as part of God's will or not. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, uh, this morning, we want to lift up our church to you. Uh, the office of deacon isn't anything to be taken lightly. It's not just something we hold or a title we have. Um, a deacon is a spiritual leader and a servant in this church. Under the election, and, and those that serve there need to be lifted up in prayer. They need to be told uh, what they should do and what they're not. Realizing that their life is called to be held to a higher standard. It's not a job to be taken lightly. It's one to be entered into with sober mind. So I want to lift up uh, Colin to you and his family and Vanessa and their kids, Father, as, as they uh, as they have volunteered for this task. Uh, 
that just volunteered but felt called because that's what someone needs in your world is these men who need to be called need to know that they're called otherwise how are they going to stand up when folks come to judge them in that way so father i pray over them that they would be sure of their calling father i pray as a church um i think the deacon body has already vetted these guys has already discussed with them uh, we even spent time training with them on their calling and their call i pray that as a church that we would uh we would heed your call that these men are displaying that we would affirm that in a meaningful way father now as we open your word i pray that your spirit would have free reign in our lives uh, not just reign where we want him to go but we truly take off the reins and let your spirit have control of our lives in the name of jesus amen palm sunday i'm sure we've all read or, or seen the text um let's let's read it First, about Jesus entering Jerusalem. Remember, he heads up to Mount of Olives, spends some time in prayer, sends his disciples ahead, and, and uh, we have the, the scene we have on Palm Sunday. Let's look at it there in Luke chapter 19. It says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you. Where you are entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are wanting untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, uh, they spread their cloaks on the ground. And as they were drawing near, already on their way down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees were in the crowd, said to them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered them, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, if we've been in church for some time, or even normally this period of time is one of those when people come back to church who may not make it a habit of attending church, we know that the crowds gathered and, and yelled, He is the King, right? Be careful, because in the passage I just read, Luke gives the account that it was the disciples that gathered. There's a difference between the disciples and everyone, isn't there? It's just like there's a difference between Cardinals fans and Cubs fans, right? One likes winners and the others like baby bears. The, sorry, I know. Is there a Cubs fan here? I'm sorry. The Cubs are looking mean this year. You stole some a good player from the Orioles and wasn't happy with it. I can say that. I was just in Illinois playing golf with some good Cubs friends of mine. But there's a difference. The disciples, those who had met Jesus, those who had encountered Jesus, those that were following him from town to town, as he came down from the Mount of Olives, they started throwing their cloaks on saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were the ones recognizing who Jesus was. Now, notice he came on a colt. Well, why did he come on a colt? Why didn't he come on this grand uh, gesture of being a king? Well, because he did it to fulfill prophecy. Notice Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, the Jews would have seen this as a sign of their Messiah. They had studied the scriptures. They had heard it in synagogues. They would have known that when they see this guy coming into town, riding on this colt, on this on this baby donkey, if you will, someone that no one has ever held a, a, a rider before, that would be their king. But as I said before, they have lived under Roman and Babylonian rule. Now, they have been away from their customs for quite some time. What they had seen of rulers and kings was someone coming with a parade in front of him. 
all the animals of, of the conquest, all of the kings and servants that they had conquered would come in before the king. And the king would come in on, on the white horse or, or the, on the chariot being pulled by the majestic steed. And behind that conquering king on a colt would be the prince. See, that was the custom. And here comes Jesus, not as a conquering king, <coughs> excuse me, but he's presented as a prince. Just as Scripture has said. <coughs> well, this doesn't make sense. Israel was needing a Messiah. They were needing a deliverer. They were under bondage. And here comes Jesus, not as a conquering king, but as the one following the conquering king, as the prince. Yes, Jesus came in as the prince of peace. But remember back to our series on We Are KBC just a few weeks ago when we talked about what it was to be a servant. Remember that whole deal about Mama Zebedee and she wanted her boys, James and John, to sit on Jesus' right and Jesus' left? Remember that whole story? And now in that passage, Jesus said that I have come to turn things upside down. The Gentiles rule over you. I have come to show you that we are going to serve you, and that's how we are going to lead. That's how we are going to be the leaders in the church today, in my church, in my kingdom. The greatest among you serves the least. So really, it shouldn't have been a shock and awe to see Jesus coming in riding a colt, to not see him riding the back of the amazing steed, for him not to have these throngs of conquerors of people in front of him, because Jesus turned things upside down. <coughs> Excuse me. And the powers that be didn't like it. Notice also, he said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those disciples were exactly quoting Psalm 118, verse 26, a messianic psalm, saying, Whoever comes, it will be said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were trying to bring Jesus' kingdom here on earth. They were doing their best to proclaim who he was. And, and the Pharisees, they got all upset, didn't they? Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, well, if I told them to be quiet, the rocks would cry out. Now, I've heard it preached, and I understand it. it's not false to say that if Jesus, if they had, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus was telling them that they can't be silent. But I also want you to notice this, that Jesus told them that the rocks would cry out because if the humans hadn't said, there's the king, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that inanimate creation would have spoken it out to be true. See, what Jesus is saying, that everything that God wrote, everything that came in prophecy, everything that was in the law, that what's said to be done about Jesus was going to happen. And if man, those that were created in his image, if we as humans, the ones who were given intellect and will, the ones who were told to have domain over the earth, if we wouldn't do our job and proclaim him as king, then inanimate creation would still do the job because God's word will not go unfulfilled. So the question hangs in the balance today for us just as it did for them. Is Jesus the king or is he a king? You see, there's a difference. There can be a lot of kings. There's a lot of people on our earth today who hold the title of king. But there can only be one true king. Is Jesus the king? Or is he a king? We're not the only ones to battle with this. Even in God's word, the disciples battled with this. Let's look in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to see an encounter with Jesus and his disciples. See, a lot of times we read the, the word and we forget to study the word. And we just think, oh, the disciples always followed Jesus. You know, ever since Jesus first encountered them, they took up everything they had and, and they followed him. But that's not true. Notice in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, it says, On an occasion... While the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesar or the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Is, is basically what that means. It's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. 
getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, we know Simon is Peter, he asked him to put out a little way from land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. But at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they became so filled, both the boats, that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Jesus was killing it. I mean, the crowds were following him. People were getting healed. Everyone was saying, yes, he's right on. This is the Messiah we need. So much so, the crowd grew so big that he did what all good Baptists do. They built a bigger building, right? Except he didn't build a bigger building. He got into a boat, backed up into the water, so there was more room for people to come and hear. And it just so happened that he gets into Simon's boat. Now, I want you to remember some things about Simon. Jesus, this wasn't the first encounter Jesus had with Simon. Jesus was teaching and walking along. And Andrew was with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, there is the Messiah. And Andrew was with him. And Andrew left John the Baptist, who was the guy who was the forerunner, right? He was doing his job. Hey, watch out. Jesus is coming. We need to be ready. The Messiah is coming. Andrew left John the Baptist and started following Jesus. And like a good disciple, you know what Andrew did? He went and found his brother because Peter wasn't there. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And God's word says they started following Jesus. Peter had such an encounter with Jesus that one day after uh, Jesus was teaching, uh, they were teaching uh, near his house. Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And Peter loved his mother-in-law. So he brought her to Jesus. And Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. All of these things happen before we get to Luke chapter 5. So understand that. The invitation to Peter to come and follow, the invitation to find out who Jesus is, Peter had already kind of followed that up. He had already started following him. But here in Luke chapter 5, something changes. Jesus gets in the boat. They back out. Peter has spent all night fishing. That's when fish come up to the bank. Peter knew that. Peter was a good fisherman. He had been out all night. Hadn't caught a thing like any true fish, fish, fisherman. One more cast. On the next cast, I'll catch something, right? On the next cast, I'll catch something, right? I, I, I was gone this last week. We went back home to Missouri. Uh, I took my son out. It was cold. We weren't dressed for it. And, and our hands were freezing. And all of a sudden, someone starts catching a fish, right? What happened to our freezing hands? We found a way to make do, right? Because we were catching fish. Peter was tired. He was worn slick. He hasn't slept. Jesus gets in his boat, backs up. He's teaching. And he tells Peter, I want you to go out further. It doesn't make sense. There's no fish out here. It's the middle of the day. Fish don't bite out there in the middle of the day. We catch fish with our nets near the bank, and they come up to feed and eat at night. But because Jesus, because Peter had a relationship with Jesus, he says, Jesus, you tell me to do this. You cured my mother-in-law. If you tell me to go drop those nets, I'm going to drop those nets. And look what happened. Wow. There was a catch. There was a catch beyond what he could handle. And he calls out to the other boats, come on. And their boats start sinking. And what was Peter's response? Man, I would have never thought we were going to catch fish out there, Jesus. You the man. <coughs> no, that's not what happened, is it? What was his response? He fell at Jesus' feet and says, I am a sinful man. When you truly encounter Jesus, when you truly understand who he is, you have a decision to make. And the decision is, is he who he says he is? Is he the king 
or is he a fake and a fraud? Is he truly God or is he just another one of God's prophets, another good man on the same level as Muhammad, on the same level as Joseph Smith? Is he truly God or is he just filler for my life? You see, we can't come to Jesus with all that we are, with all who we who we who we who we've developed ourselves into be in our life. And then say, Jesus, I don't really need all of you. What I really need is I need you to be a good body repairman. I, you know, I need you to I need you to pop out some dents. I need you to fill over some rust, maybe put a little bondo in there, spray some good paint over it so no one can see the rust anymore. That's what I need from you. You know what the problem with bondoing over rust and painting over it is? Is the rust gone? No. Our sin is like cancer. It eats at us. The way to get rid of sin is to cut it out. Jesus isn't a answer for sin. Jesus is the cure for sin. You can't come to Jesus and say, I just want you to touch this up. I want you to wash this over, and, and then my life will be good. You can try it. But that cancer's still there. That sin's still there, eating away. And then we wonder why we have issues. You didn't let Jesus have full control. You didn't let Jesus heal you. You came to Jesus with all you are, and you held on to it and asked Jesus to do, to do a miracle while you still had control. Peter had a decision to make. He falls down at Jesus' feet. He says, I am a sinner. And the next thing we see is he sells everything he had and he follows Jesus. Well, Scott, that's kind of a radical statement. Jesus doesn't call all of us to that, does he? Well, if you read the Bible, actually he does. He calls us to follow him with everything we have. Notice these men traveled with Jesus for three years, leaving their family for weeks at a time. Well, that's awful insensitive to Jesus. How are they going to make, make a living for their family? These guys, as you read, had employees. Oh, did you forget to remember two boatloads of fish they caught? Did you not notice he had ships and tackle that could be sold to provide for his family while he traveled around with Jesus for three years? Jesus knows your needs. He will meet your needs. The question is, are you willing to leave everything and follow him? Is he the king? Or is he a king? The Pharisees saw the sign. The Pharisees knew the story. How come their take on Jesus was different than the disciples? Peter had walked with him before this encounter. Why hadn't he left everything and followed Jesus before? We have a decision to make. Is Jesus truly the whole enchilada? I know, it's good to boast along. I don't know about to be there. Is Jesus everything? Or is he just a sacrifice? In the late 1970s, there, were a the, there was a theologic, theological discussion or doctrine that was espoused called Lordship Salvation. Maybe some of you have some Bible uh, study Bibles from that era, and Lordship Salvation is in a lot of the footnotes. Basically, what Lordship Salvation said is that you're truly not saved until Jesus is Lord of your entire life. In other words, until everything you have has come under his authority until you've gotten rid of all your sin and, and everything that would get in between you and Jesus, he's, you're not truly saved. Well, I, I kind of have an issue with that personally. Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. He needs to have everything in your life come under his authority. But as we studied today, people encounter Jesus at different points in their life. Even after they've encountered Jesus, they haven't made the decision that they should. And Jesus is patient with them, waiting for them to buy in. Not buy in, waiting for them to see that Jesus truly is the cure for the sin that will kill us. So the question for us today is, 
is Jesus king or is he a king? Do our Bibles sit on the mantle with pictures of our family and with pictures of, of our cars and with pictures of our businesses? And when it's time to go to family things, Jesus is left behind. When it's time to do, to do car things, Jesus is left behind. When it's time to go to church, you'll leave all that other stuff behind. See, Peter had encountered Jesus. Peter had seen him heal his mother-in-law. And yet his relationship to him was, was a basic commitment. You know, Jesus, I believe you're the man. I'm going to give some money to your cause. I'll go to church. I'll listen to some of your teaching. And, and, and I want to be your disciple. That's the initial stages of Peter's relationship with Jesus. And then, when Jesus does something that only Jesus can do, when Peter understands more about Jesus, he falls at his feet and he says, I'm a sinner. He leaves everything behind and he follows Jesus. Is Jesus king in your life or is he a king? As a body of believers, is Jesus king and Lord of this church or is he a fallback? came to be the king. God established him to be the king before the foundations of the earth. But somehow in our arrogance and our sin, we think we get to make that choice. And we're miserable and, and, and we're kicking and, and we're suffering all along the way until we truly make him king of our lives. Easter. This Friday. We call it Good Friday. We call it Good Friday. You know, we call Good Friday Good Friday when, when an innocent, the truly only innocent man was murdered. We call it good because of what it benefited for us. Man, that's a selfish way to approach salvation, huh? We call it good because God took on flesh and died. Man, we even, in, even in the way that we celebrate our, our religious holidays, we have a way of turning it and making it about us, don't we? It wasn't good. My God was murdered. But he was murdered for me. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate a risen Lord. Sin doesn't have dominion. That cancer of sin can be taken care of. I don't know when it's taken care of. I know that the Bible is clear. If we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. I know that. I know that Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to set everything aside and truly follow me. I also know that Jesus was patient with Peter. He was patient with Nicodemus when he came at night. He was patient with the rich young ruler. And we see later, in, 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 as we watch the Bible stories, that these guys came around to fully giving their life to Jesus Christ. So the question for us today, where are you in your journey with Jesus Christ? Is he a king or is he the king? It was enjoyable for Peter when Jesus was a king. But after Peter devoted his life, he saw things that blew those initial miracles out of the water. God, Jesus, never disappoints. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning, as we study your word on Palm Sunday, the question has to be out there. Do we recognize you as King and Lord of our life, or are you just something we're going to add on? And, and I don't know hearts, Father. I, I can't speak to what's going on in lives. I can see in my life how patient you were with me as, as I grew in my relationship with you. Like Colin said in his testimony, how, how his relationship takes time to truly understand what it means to love someone, to grow with someone. Where are we in our growth and our walk with you? Forgive us when we've taken over the throne of our life. When we've called you Lord, when we've, when we've said your name, but you truly know not to say it. Help us to submit to you as a king who showed us how to serve, how to love others. In your name we pray, amen. I don't know.
don't know where you are today in your walk with the Lord. I don't know if Jesus is truly king of your life, or if you just got him as, as an added rope. You know, I've got good works. And if those don't get me to heaven, I, I'm going to go ahead and claim the cross too. Well, it doesn't work that way. If it did, Jesus died in vain. God became flesh in vain. Maybe as a Christian, you've been holding back. You've bought into a humanistic or, or to even a, a Hellenistic, or, or that's what the Bible call it, where you mix works and faith together. Jesus truly isn't king because you're still counting on what you're doing. Is Jesus going to be ruler and Lord in your life? Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.